points by a number of data points. So it's n by n, right? U, so m is, m is n by n, u is k by n, and u transpose is n by k. But if you go on like before, yeah, here, the wij, I'm summing over all j's into bi, right? Yeah, so, okay, uh, right, right, right here? Here, yeah. Yeah, and so, so this wij is a scalar. Yeah, and I have exactly. Use a vector. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but u is bigger, and I've only grabbed a couple of components of them, not all of them. So what happens? If u is... Because, I mean, wj is in length exactly as many neighbors I have, right? That's how we define it. It's like the That's right. Side. That's right. It's every neighbors you have. Yeah. yeah. So this is a scalar product of this, like, wij vector with uj. That's right. So uj is the same dimension as v, or is it... And not the the same. U is the dimensions. It's like it's like it's, it's like W. It's like W is. It's like W is um, n by n, and then you're masking parts of it away, and then you want to. Oh, this is not a scalar product. This is a linear combination of yeah. v amount of u. Right. You, you, you oh, can imagine the n by n matrix being oh, okay. for for j i j in v for for i j satisfying this. It's not zero. And for every other wij is zero, right? So, so this like, matrix. For uj, it's not like the j component of u. It's just the j of u, and u is still a vector. Okay. Yeah, a vector. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, so the notation is a vector. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought yeah. it's a scalar product. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to um, I'll move on to uh, the next part of the lecture, which is probabilistic sequence embeddings. So here's one example. Um, you know, people create a lot of playlists on these uh, online uh, music services such as Pandora, Spotify, etc. Um, so you, know, you create song playlists, and you can think of song playlists as uh, sequences of songs, right? Sequences of some item, abstractly. And you can think of these as training data. And can we learn a probabilistic model of sequences of songs? Another example: a word embed. People write text all the time. Text, you can think of natural text, you can think of a sequence of words, right? A sentence is a sequence of words. Can we learn a probabilistic model of word sequences given a large body of text that people have So, this is the idea of probabilistic sequence modeling. Um, so, let capital S denote your training set, which, sorry, sorry, uh, capital S is your ground set of, 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 of song IDs or word IDs, capital D. Capital D is your set of training set of playlists or, or documents or sentences, and each of each entry in capital D is a sequence. So each one of these corresponds to one of these. Each one, each each entry in your in, in a sequence corresponds to one of your items. And let's say uh, a simple goal, and this is not the only goal we'll look at, but one simple goal is let's learn a Markov model over sequences, over the entries in the sequence, right? Like the HMM, similar, very similar to the HMM. So one question is, what, what should be the form of uh, this probability function, right? Now, on the one hand, uh, there's a discrete number of songs, and a discrete number of words. It could be very large, it could be like a million, but it's discrete. So we can just write this as a probability table, right? So we've already done, gone through this exercise, I guess, a couple weeks ago. Uh, but you know, one big problem with this is that the number of parameters is square, quadratic, in the uh, number of uh, items in your ground set number of songs and number of words, both of which can be huge, right? If there's a million songs in, in say, Spotify, that is 10 to the 12 uh, parameters in this parameter matrix. That's huge. Even if you have a lot of training data, you don't want, you want, you don't want to estimate that. And it gets even worse if you want to do higher order sequence models, other than beyond first order models, right? Okay, that's bad. Second, try this. You know, maybe we could just model this as a hidden Markov model. Why not? Right? Hidden Markov model makes assumes that there's some set of latent states, the Z, latent parameters, we'll call them Z, and then the transition is sort of if the latent, number of latent parameters is K, then it's sort of you have this transition matrix, and then then you have this emission matrix. So you know the number of parameters is much much smaller. Right? We've seen this already. Of course, with the problem with hidden Markov models is that with this form posits uh, the existence of this factorization approach, right? It posits the existence that the model, the sequence should be factorized in this approach, 
and there's some sort of latent states that that is what we care about, right? And so we need to re reliably estimate these guys and these guys, which is you know hard to do, right? What is these? These are like labels. Latent states of a hidden Markov model. I don't want to spend too much time on hidden Markov models because that's the point of the lecture. We're going to look at um, sequence modeling of using embeddings. And we'll look at two examples, playlist and word. Word embedding, a word embedding, the word embedding problem is a homework question. Uh, there are sort of code and papers and data sets available for both. Um, in particular, the word embedding approach that we're looking at uh, is a simplified version of the word to vec approach that Google released. And it's very useful, in fact, had you known about it, it would have been very useful for the uh, Kaggle competition. But you know, I guess no one discovered it on their own, huh? That's all right. Maybe next year. OK, and then we'll finally I'll sort of compare and contrast the, the, sort of the abstract properties of the two approaches. OK, so let's talk about the song embedding first. So in the song embedding, we're going we're gonna to learn a Markov embedding. So what is, uh, we, we're, we're going to learn a distance version of the embedding. What does that mean? That means we're going to have two, we're going to learn two uh, 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 representations, low relatively low dimensional representations for every song, a U and a V, where U is the entry point and V is the exit point. Okay? What does that mean? That means if I'm currently at song S prime, then the probability distribution that the next song will be song S is proportional to this distance function, where we look at the exit value of, we look at the exit location of song S prime, and we look at the entry location of song S, and look at their distance, right? And then the full probability distribution would then look like this, where sum over every possible song. What is the entry point? What is the exit point? So let's say, so let's say we want to model, um, let's say we want to model uh, a sequence of songs, right? So at, if, we, if our training data If our training data is a sequence of songs, then we want to model the transition probability, of, and, we, and we assume Markovian, right? Then we want to, what we, the, thing, the main thing we want to model is the probability distribution of, given that we just played song S prime, what is the distribution of the next song we're going to play right? in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a random playlist from our training set, right? Give it, uh, estimated from the set of all playlists in our training set, right? And so we do so by hypothesizing two parameter vectors for each song. An exit, an exit point, and an entry point, right? And as when we finish playing song S prime, we look at where, it, where we look at its exit point in the embedding, and then we find all the songs that are whose entry points are close to it, and we pick a and basically pick one that's close to it. That's so basically what this distribution. We say. US and the VS point are and learned from data. We want to estimate. Learned from data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. So uh, what are some properties of this particular uh, form? Um, so uh, in this, I, you know, I, I call this, as my own terminology, I call it a log radio function. What that basically means is, um, if, this is you know, if this is a two-dimensional visualization of where the exit point of song S prime is, then every, every song whose entry point lies in this circle is, forms an equivalence class of transition probabilities. They're all, equi they're all equal probable. Right? Every song that whose, whose entry point is on this circle, this equal distance away from uh, the exit point of song S prime, has, is equal probable. Right? It's an equivalence class of probable songs. Right? And the further you are, the less likely you are to transition, this model is to transition from the song S prime to that song, and, this, and, this, uh, this, and the decay of the probability is exponential. Yeah. I'm sorry? What is entry point and exit point? So we posit in our model that every song is associated with an entry point and an exit point. So it's, it, it, they're parameters of the model. And what, the, what, those, what these parameters tell you is they specify a probabilistic transition model. If we're modeling a playlist, a sequence of songs, if we're, and, we're do, we're, and we're making a Markovian assumption, first order Markovian assumption, then we're currently at song S prime in our sequence. We want to model the distribution of songs S that we could transition to. And we do so 
by looking at the exit point of song S prime, which is a model that we, which is a parameter vector that we learned for song S prime, and we look at all the songs whose entry vectors U is close to it, and that's a, that defines our probability distribution, basically. Oh, those are just parameters. Parameters are the parameters that we learned. This, is, like this is the model. Assume that we have, an, assume, let's assume, prior to training, let's assume that we just have a U and a V for every song. Okay. Right? Then this is our, this is our, this is our probabilistic model of sequences of songs. Is there like an intuitive way to think about the Let's say that people like to listen to certain types of songs right after other types of songs. Like, um, after a sad song, we'll listen to a happy song, let's say. Let's say that's in the training set, right? We look at playlists, sequences of songs. Assume they're not played at randomized, right? Assume they're, they're like deterministic playlists um, that we, we, we have training sets over. Then let's say after a sad song, people, want to, people often play a happy song more likely than not, more likely than random chance. Then we, want, then we would want to learn an embedding over songs, such as the sad song's entry points, the happy song's entry points, are close to sad song's exit points. So this is assuming that there's like a, that it's not symmetric, that, you know. Yeah, this is asymmetric, yes. Yeah. So if, if, if we learn a single embedding over our songs, then the direction is irrelevant, or almost irrelevant. So learning problem is as follows. Um, you know, we have a set of playlists. Let's say, let's say we scrape Spotify, right? Spotify is not worse. Let's say we scrape Last FM, right? Um, and so we have a set of playlists that people have made. It could be like, you know, it could be a large number. It could be like a hundred thousand playlists. It could be a million playlists. And each playlist is a sequence of songs. So each of these tokens in the sequence corresponds to one of our one of the songs in our ground set of songs, item set of songs. The goal is to, you know, and our model is basically, uh, then the goal is to find a, a U and a V matrix over songs that maximizes the probability of the training set, right, this unsupervised learning. And this pro the form of this probability function is Markovian, so it decomposes into this product, and each of these looks like this, right? And we have to learn the U and the Vs to maximize this. I won't go over all the details, but the typical way to solve this is to convert this maximization problem into over product into minimizing a sum over negative log likelihoods. We've seen this several times already in this class. Basically the same idea. You, you take a negative log of this, you differentiate it with respect to U and V, you degrade it uh, This is a non-convex optimization problem, just like in last week's late factor models. And so you, the initialization is important. Typically, people just do random initialization. So they randomly initialize U and V, and then they do gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent of this. There is one complication to this problem that is a little bit different from, say, logistic regression. You, you, some people, you, have, you have observed this a little bit in CRFs. But can anyone tell me what's, what is one potential computational complexity of this, of this of the computing the gradient of this guy? I'm sure at least some of you have struggled with this as well in the CRF one. So computing the, the gradient of the log partition function can be very expensive, right? Um, because this sums over every song in our ground set. So this sums over every capital, uh, the number of uh, songs in our ground set. If we have a million songs in our ground set, you have to sum over a million things to compute this guy every time you compute the gradient of the log partition function. Some of you uh, suffered similar difficulties when you computed the log partition function for, uh, for the CRF homework, uh, if you didn't cache your some of the computation intelligent, right? And um, there's some approximation heuristics that people use to deal with this. I'll just refer you to this paper if you're interested in the details. But um, they, they typically you do that, you, you approximate it. You approximate this guy. And so and there's some obvious things you can see. For example, you know, if you look at this, you know, everything's centered around the V of S prime, and this thing decays exponentially, so things that are quite far away from V of S prime, you don't even need to sum them. Right? Doesn't really make a difference. It's like, it'll underflow so fast. Right? But then there are other heuristics you can use as well. 
Okay, so, story so far, playlist embedding. I've given a training set of playlists, which are sequences of songs, build, this, build these probability tables. You, build it, you can think of these tables as sort of at the raw unstructured version of these tables have a lot of missing values. So we assume that this probability table have, can be filled in using this uh, low dimensional embedding over songs. Right. right. So we talked about um, why is it that there's an entry point and an exit point. We could also consider a simpler version, which is a single point model. And if we do this, the transitions are almost symmetric. So forwards or backwards in the playlist. But the form of the training problem is exactly the same. One reason why you might prefer a single point model is that it's easier to visualize. Yeah. So here's a visualization um, that I grabbed off uh, the project, their, this project website, uh, where um, sort of the view sort of color and you uh, sort of uh, marker code all the songs of various, uh, not all, but some of the songs of various artists on a two-dimensional embedding. This is what it looks like. And you see that they tend to sort of cluster together because presumably there are a lot of playlists that if they can contain one Lady Gaga song, it'll contain other Lady Gaga songs. And so uh, if you think about sort of what the probability transition looks like, it's basically saying that if we're at this song, the probability that I transition to another song decays exponentially with distance from this song as defined by this embedding, right? Sampling new playlists. So this is a full, this type of model is actually fully generative. Um, so if you're given a partial playlist, you, you, know, you want to sample the next playlist song in the playlist, Markovian property, so you just sort of just uh, you know, sample from this distribution. And again, you can approximate this by not having to look at every possible song, just the ones that are close to the exit point, just the ones whose entry points are close to the exit point of the previous song, of the, of the current uh, last song, because um, you know, this, the, the probabilities decay exponentially. All right, so let's see if this works. Oops. Favorite artist? All right, so we generated a probabilistic playlist. This is the this is the, the, the this is the playlist in the embedding space. And here is the uh, song. So this uh, this model is sort of learned from I think last time demo. I'm not sure. And then if you start if you give it a seed song, and you tell it to generate a playlist, a random sample of playlist, it will just do so by the Markov Markov model as the final is embedding. So if you start here, the next song is sort of, you know, close by, and then some, and then it jumped over here, and then it jumped here, and then it jumped here. So, you know, there's, there's some, uh, like, it's hard to visualize, but there's some exponential decay going on here. So at some point, the decay goes really, goes really far. So you never, you basically never jump this far, but anything sort of in this neighborhood is reasonable. And then you could actually control the, the quote unquote temperature of the jumping by, um, by, let's go back to this. You control the temperature of the jumping by uh, dividing this by some constant. So if you divide it by a large constant, the distribution looks a lot flat. And that, that's actually in the, in the demo itself. You can control how jumpy it is. Anyways, if you could play with it yourself. Okay, so what about new songs, right? So this is the cold start problem. If we, we've trained this U and the V, uh, so here I'm just looking at the single point model for simplicity. 
we train this U um, on songs that we have playlists for. So that means people, presumably users of this music service have uh, been exposed to this song and have added it to various playlists. A brand new song has not been added to any playlist, right? And if you add regularization to this optimization problem, then the U will be zero, right? So one thing you can do is to you know, look at side information, such as tags. Songs are usually added with tags. And you can treat these tags as sort of attributes of songs. And you know, one way, and you could sort of exploit that to be able to generate new, a reasonable embedding for new songs, even in the absence of any playlist that the song belongs to. And one way to do so is to learn embedding over tags. And so I'm going to go over this a little bit quickly because I'm running possibly a little short on time. Um, and so the basic idea is the training set now looks like a ground set of songs. Um, set of playlists, you know, training sets, playlists have this notation of uh, structure, and then a set of tags. So every, every song has a set of tags. And the learning objective is um, more or less the same as before. Certainly this term is the same as before. This, uh, the next term is, is um, saying that um, for every song, for every for the representation of songs that we learn, it should be close. We're also we're also going to learn we're going to learn a representation over both songs, which is U, and tags, which is denoted by the A matrix, such that the song we're going to, we want the song representation to be close to the average representation of the tags. And this lambda term is just a Cartoon parameter that trades off between how much you care about this one versus this one. So this, this term versus this term. So what this means is that we can, for the songs that we do have, for the songs that we have seen in the playlists, right? For the songs that we have seen in playlists, we can use that to inform what the, uh, we can use that to inform what the tags look like, right? Because this is sort of a, you can, this is sort of a kind of almost like a chicken and egg problem, which makes it non-convex, right? And so, um, and so we've seen a bunch of Lady Gaga songs. We know that most Lady Gaga songs have this have a few of these tags, and so we can know that the tags, the location of the tag representation in the embedding, should be close to Lady Gaga songs. Now, when a new song comes along, let's say it's a Lady Gaga song, and it has these tags, one of the tags could be by Lady Gaga, by the way. Um, um, then it, even in the absence of not knowing, uh, of no training data in the form of playlists, we already have a good initialization of it because it's simply, it will simply be the average of the, uh, of the tags. So here's just the 2D visualization of the tags. Right? So here are just some of the tags that uh, they tried. To, uh, there's rap, hip hop, punk, hard rock, rock and roll, Christian rock, oldies, country, easy listening. So, you know, it kind of makes sense in terms of what they're close to and what they're further far away from. Wait, how are they, how are they their average that are outside of them? They look like R and D, so like it's outside of all the points. Like of what? What would they mean after? I suspect there are some songs out here that they're not new, but there's a few outliers. This thing is sensitive to outliers. Yeah. How does the complexity of training the motor train not much. Um, you just do gradient descent. You, so you, you, you minimize the negative log likelihood of this, right? So you just sum over a log of these. And then this, it, the number of tags typically be quite small. So it's um, compared to the, yeah, so it's, I think at worst it doubles the, uh, the, the, the computation time. But I think it's a lot less than that. Because the number, of, the number of playlists is a lot more than the number of tags per I think in the worst case, approximately doubles the training time. Right, so if, if, if a brand new song gets added and has a bunch of tags, by this objective function, um, it's, it doesn't impact this part of it at all because it's not in any playlists. And um, we have an RF, and the only, in order to maximize this, we simply choose it as the average of the tags that it has it, been tagged. That's how we can solve the close start problem. Okay, switching gears.
for the last part of the lecture on word embedding. So, you know, let's say we have a large corpus of text, like Wikipedia documents, Google News articles. We want to learn a word embedding to model sort of sequences of words, let's, uh, or, or uh, you know, sliding windows of words, right? So, we're going to use, we're not going to use a distance-based embedding, right? So the previous uh, playlist uh, embedding used distances to, to capture semantics, right? Uh, we're now going to look at capturing semantics using the inner products, which is, you know, very much like a link factor model. And in fact, there are versions of this problem that are basically just a, exactly a link factor model. In our case, though, it's a link factor model inside a uh, logistic, basically a multi-class logistic regression function. So, um, you know, what is the problem? So, if we wanted to learn, if we wanted to, if we had a training set of the form this like this, we're going to learn this type of probability table. Then, basically, if we're at, let's say we also have exit points and entry points. Okay, we also have exit points and entry points. Then, you know, if this is the if this is the uh, the vector v of our uh, of our exit point for s prime, then the probability of any other s with you know in sort of each of these lines uh, defines a projection. So the inner product of this guy and this guy projects onto here, like at this magnitude. And so both of these u's have the same projection onto v, which means they have the same numerator value. Okay. And both of these blue lines have the same projection onto v, so they also have the same numerator value. So now the equivalence classes of equal probabilities are these projection levels onto v. This is the semantics. This is so when you do an inner product embedding, this is the semantics you're capturing. You're, you're capturing you're, to to describe whatever relationship you're, a, you're trying to model in your training set. When you do dis, when you do distance-based embeddings, you use distances. Okay, so here's version one, which is just um, a straight-up Markov embedding over words. So this looks basically exactly like. Um, the, uh, the playlist embedding, except we're just using inner product models instead of distance models, distance based models. So this looks exactly the same. What's actually in the word to vec approach, which is, um, which is one of the most sort of popular approaches now to, model, to building word embeddings, is what's called a skipgram model, which is a little bit different from a Markov embedding. It's almost more like a sliding window prediction model. And the basic idea is as follows. For every sequence of words, so you can think of this as an entire document, or just, or you can think of each I as an entire document, or just as, or just a sentence. Um, for every token in this sequence, I want to train a U and a V that maximizes the probability that a word, a, a, a word, the, the word at uh, location J in sequence I, will can predict its neighbors both before and after up to a window of capital C. Right. So um, uh, a standard sort of forward Markov embedding says, I'm only interested in predicting the probability, predicting the, uh, the immediate next word. Here it's saying, I actually want to predict both the words before and the words after right. in, in, this, in a single model. Right. So this looks like this. So this is this is called the skip grant model. So it's not a, it's still a, you know more or less a sequence modeling sequence model, but it's one that's more of a sliding window and looks also backwards and forwards rather than uh, Markov makes a Markovian assumption. So what are some benefits of the skip grant model? Like why would we choose to use this instead of something like a Markov embedding? Well, for one, a skip grant model models more than just one word away from you, one location away from you, which can have benefits. So for example, let's just assume that some of the sentences in our training set include the dog jumped over the fence, my dog ate my homework, I walked my dog up to the fence. Okay, so if capital C, the sort of the, so if capital C was sufficiently large, then we would notice that, you know, in two out of three sentences here, dog is, so dog, if, if you know, this, 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 this term, uh, iterates over every uh, word in, in every training sentence. So a dog appears three times, right? So if capital C was sufficiently large, we would notice that fence was in the neighborhood, right? This is what it means. 
predicting the predicting the words in the neighborhood of, of the of the of the word, both forward and backwards, we would notice that fence was in two out of two out of three of the neighborhoods of up to of size four or five, whatever it is, of the word dog, right? And that's something we can capture in this model. Well, if we only look at C equals one, then we would just look at the immediate left and right neighbors, right? So this allows us to capture sort of um, sort of a smoother semantics, a smoother semantic of prediction probabilities. Obviously, fence is not going to always appear with dog, but fence is probably going to appear uh, co-occur co with dog somewhere in the window more often.